So now we would like to turn the meeting over to Joel Fine, our Vice President of Programs, who will introduce tonight's speaker. tonight, but before I introduce the speaker, I want to tell you a little story. The other day I was chatting with a friend of mine from Russia, trying to explain to him how much freer we are here in America. I said to him, in America, I can go on television and say, my president is an idiot with no consequences whatsoever. He scoffed. He said, in Russia I have the same rights. I can go on television and I can say, your president is an idiot, <laughs> with no consequences whatsoever. <laughs> Speaking of freedoms, our speaker tonight, Greg Lukyanov, serves as the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which also goes by the acronym FIRE, a position he's held since 2006. The mission of FIRE is to defend individual rights at America's colleges and universities. These rights include freedom of speech, legal equality, due process, religious liberty, and sanctity of conscience, the essential qualities of individual liberty and dignity. Unfortunately, these rights are frequently under direct attack on colleges campuses, college campuses here in the United States. FIRE's core mission is to protect the unprotected and to educate the public about the threats to these rights on our campuses and about how to preserve them. Besides serving as president of FIRE, Greg is the author of Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, which by no coincidence is also the title of his talk tonight. He's a member of the State Bar of California and the Bar of the Supreme Court of the United States. He's published articles in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reason, and numerous other publications. He's a co-author of FIRE's Guide to Free Speech on Campus. Greg is a frequent guest on radio and television programs, ranging from CBS Evening News to The O'Reilly Factor to MSNBC. He has testified before the U.S. Senate about free speech issues on America's campuses. He's a recipient of the Playboy Foundation Freedom of Expression Award and Ford Hall Forum's First Amendment Award. <laughs> Greg is a graduate of American University and of Stanford Law School, where he focused on First Amendment and constitutional law. The organization that Greg leads, FIRE, has no stated political affiliation and has represented causes for parties with varied political viewpoints, ranging from conservative, liberal, and religious system groups to other activists, such as the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals and even Professor Ward Churchill. Regardless of the principles or beliefs of FIRE's clients, FIRE's focus on individual liberty is entirely compatible with the mission of the Conservative Forum, which is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. Please help me welcome a fellow traveler, a fighter for individual rights, and a champion of liberty, Mr. Greg Lukianoff. on America's college campuses. I'm going to start by uh, giving some examples and comparing them with some stats. Um, the first one you might have heard of uh, took place actually in California. Um, it happened the day after my birthday this year, um, kind of a weird birthday present, uh, which is uh, September 17th, uh, Constitution Day. A student attempted to hand out copies, and I just I have to say it with that tone, a student attempted to hand out copies of the Constitution to honor Constitution Day, and he was told by various employees of the university that he could not. He was told that he had to go to the 
little free speech zone over there. Uh, you, you can actually see the video of this. And that he had to give advanced permission in order to hand out constitutions. Not on Constitution Day. Apparently the free speech zone was available in three days or sometime in October. A previous generation of students would have rioted <coughs> having heard about this. Uh, this generation hasn't. And I think that there's a genuine chill going on. Uh, the, the, while I was researching the book, one study that, I, that came out while I was writing it, which was kind of fortuitous, was the American Association of Colleges and Universities uh, surveyed 25,000 students across the country. And they asked them this question, and they phrased it this way. Is it safe to hold unpopular points of view on your campus? Now think about that question. If you ask it that way, you're looking for 100% of the students to come back and say, sure, it's safe to hold them. I'm not in danger for believing something. It might be a bad idea to talk about it. It might be, a <laughs> it might be risky to challenge a professor about it, but sure, it's safe to hold them. But only 40% of college freshmen strongly agreed with the statement that it is, was safe to merely hold a popular points of view on campus. And guess what? The longer you are on campus, the worse it got. Juniors were more pessimistic, uh, sorry, sophomores were more pe pessimistic, juniors more pessimistic still, and, uh, and seniors got all the way down to 30%. And guess who the most pessimistic group of all was? <laughs> professors. Only 16.7% of university professors strongly agree with the statement that it is safe to merely hold unpopular points of view on campus. And here's the, another side of what's going on here, and one of the reasons why I think you don't hear as much about it. Um, did you all hear about what happened to you when, when uh, Ray Kelly uh, spoke at Brown, or tried to speak at Brown the, the, this past fall? Uh, a bunch of students showed up. They didn't want Ray Kelly speaking there. Ray Kelly was the uh, police commissioner of, of, of New York City, uh, controversial stop and frisk uh, program. And they shouted him down uh, for half an hour, so much so there was no point to going on with the speech. Um, the only thing that was surprising to me about this case was that someone actually paid attention to this one. Um, this is actually, within fire, uh, we've gotten so used to it that we sort of snidely refer to this time of year as dis-invitation season. Because so many speakers, particularly, frankly, social conservatives or, or conservatives, or, or in this case, uh, or in another case, members of the Bush administration, which is currently happening with Condoleezza Rice, where she's supposed to give a, um, uh, a, a commencement address, and they're already starting to try to block that on, on the campus where she's supposed to speak. Um, but this happens pretty much every year like clockwork. And where, where is this coming from? I wrote, a, I wrote an article called The Expectation of Confirmation. Um, I th some of you might know what confirmation bias is. That's the tendency to believe that you're right and only to confirm your own hypothesis. Generally in science, this is considered a bad thing. But I think we're raising a generation that has an expectation of confirmation. That essentially points of view that show up that might challenge or offend, and God forbid, on a campus, are not wanted. And something, a, a piece of data that backs that up also came out um, th this past summer. The First Amendment uh, Center asked students this question, do you think the First Amendment goes too far? They have asked this question for decades now, um, and generally uh, it's, the answer's been pretty good. Mo most American citizens don't think the First Amendment goes too far. But this year was the worst year that they had uh, since 9-11, uh, since with 34% of American citizens saying the First Amendment goes too far. <clears throat> but let's break down that number a little more. Uh, if you break it down demographically, people over 60, practically none of them believe that the First Amendment goes too far. Uh, people over the age of 30, very few believe that the First Amendment goes too far. And, what it, and guess what? 18 to 30 year olds, 47 percent. And I can tell you, I speak on campuses a lot. I will t I'm going to tell you some stories, some more stories about what FIRE deals with, and this will curl most American citizens' toes. And over the years, though, students have gotten increasingly shoulder shrugging about gross violations of their fellow students' rights. And I think that it's partially coming from when you, uh, when you have an environment that promises you that people won't disagree with you too much, you start not, not just taking free speech for granted, but you might actually start to think it's a bad thing. And I think that's happening. 
So I want to give you a little more about my background. I was the weird law student. Um, I actually went to law school to do First Amendment law. Uh, my father is a Russian refugee. My mother's British, and they have very different ideas on politeness. <laughs> My mother believes you have to be polite at all costs, and my father believes that politeness is a form of deception. <laughs> and, and it's funny, and this is a true story. My, my, uh, my actual second earliest memory right after what I got for my fourth birthday was Christmas when I was, uh, when I was four years old. And I got a drum from my Auntie Rona. Um, it was a cheap plastic drum, and it was the first gift I'd ever gotten that I actually thought was a piece of junk. <laughs> and so my mom's looking at me, and she's going, what do you think, dear? And I look at my dad, and he, he just kind of goes, he goes he smiles at me with a big Russian smile. And I'm like, I have to be honest, I have to be polite. I have to be honest, I have to be polite. I have to be honest, I have to be polite. And so I end up doing what any fourth grader in that situation would do, or sort of four-year-old would do in that situation. I start crying. <laughs> and I'm the youngest of four, so my, my oldest sister, uh, Katie, starts going, Oh, baby, doesn't like what he, uh, what he got for Christmas, starts crying. And I really wish I had a better vocabulary at four, because I would have just said, No, it's my first experience with a cultural paradox. <laughs> And yeah, and, and, but, and it's kind of funny because I never realized that that story had First Amendment implications until fairly recently when I realized, oh right, you can't always be honest and polite. Uh, it's nice to be polite, but it's a, a small, small value uh, when it comes to actual democratic deliberation, actually talking, actually having candor, actually telling each other what we really think. So I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment. I took every class that Stanford offered on First Amendment, and I uh, ran out of them, so I did six credits more on censorship during the Tudor dynasty. <laughs> I remember explaining this to one of my friends, um, and I was so excited about it, and he looked at me with horror saying, who's making you do that? <laughs> I, I, I barely had the heart to explain, I came up with a project myself. <laughs> So, despite that, despite working in, in, in advocacy for First Amendment, um, I and have a real knowledge of, of, of free speech and, and, and uh, history, both in the U.S. and outside of it, I was not prepared for the kind of things I would see on college campuses. It is incredibly easy to get in trouble for what you say on college campuses these days. And FIRE is heading into its 50th year. Uh, this year, actually, this is our 50th. Um, and we're having our 15th anniversary celebration uh, in, in New York uh, in October. And despite the fact I've been doing this for years, universities still shock me on a regular basis. Uh, my book, On Learning Liberty, comes out uh, on paperback. Actually, it, it's already there, um, but it's not actually due out for until a week from today. But so there's a little sneak preview, I guess. And I, I feel like I can explain what, um, a lot of what I've learned from simply the title of the book, the full title of the book. Unlearning Liberty is what we talk about within FIRE when we see student governments, uh, I, I, can, I could go on all day about student governments, student governments literally passing, the, this happened at the University of Wisconsin. The student government at the University of Wisconsin literally passed a rule um, on campus that they called proudly the Sedition Act. <laughs> that made it a campus offense to criticize the student government. <laughs> Complete lack of awareness of American history. The, the Sedition Act is something we're ashamed of, generally. Like, we, we, we sort of apologize for it. And they, they passed it as a thinking, of, oh, Sedition Act, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> And the end of American debate, so basically what, what unlearning liberty is what we say when we think that students have learned to think like censors and when they've learned to not think like free people. On the one hand, if you think you have a right not to be offended, you're thinking like a censor. Uh, on the other hand, if you think that it makes sense for you to ask state power for permission to protest state power, you're not understanding what it means to be a member of democracy. But the end of American debate, the, the second title of the book, is, is a subtle point that essentially censorship doesn't really change people's minds. It doesn't change the content of your heart. What it does is it encourages people to talk to the people they already agree with. Um, and honestly, if you're a student today on campus and you talk to the people you already agree with, 
Join the groups that reflect what you believe in high school. Don't disagree with professors whose egos can't take it. And generally avoid controversial topics. You're probably not going to get in trouble. I'm probably not going to have to help you out of the case. But here's the problem with that. That's everything we're doing wrong as a society right now. The one institution that could actually be helping us learn from each other, higher education, learn to actually uh, to talk across lines of difference, is doing the exact opposite. It is encouraging people to shut their mouths if they have the quote unquote wrong opinion. So here's some more examples just to show you how, how bad this has gotten. Uh, probably like to the extent to which there are any famous cases I deal with, probably the most famous case um, was a student at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. He was reading a book called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It was about the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. The Klan was also anti-Catholic. Catholic students got together and they fought off the Ku Klux Klan. It is a happy, uh, celebratory book about, uh, about bullies getting their comeuppance. But because it had the word Klan in the title, and it had a picture of the rally when they marched on Notre Dame, he was found guilty of racial harassment. <laughs> by the way, the book was in the library, which makes it all of them just all that much more ironic. And by the way, I, I do point out, even if it was a genuinely offensive book, it would still be protected. Just the fact that it was actually gleefully anti-racist just makes the fact he was punished for it much more ironic. <laughs> and believe it or not, it took the combined effort of, yes, the ACLU, Fire and the Wall Street Journal to get the university to entirely back down. There's another case that I, I can also spend the entire time talking about. How many are familiar with the orientation program at the University of Delaware? No. Oh my. <laughs> well, you, you know all the stories about crazy sort of you know North Korea type brainwashing programs that always seem kind of overheated when people talk about them happening on campuses. This is the closest I've ever seen to it. I devote practically an entire chapter of my book to this program because I can't really do it justice, but just to give you some examples of some of the things that all 7,000 students who lived in the dormitories at University of Delaware had to uh, take part in. It included mandatory floor meetings in which you would name a social issue, uh, talk about you know uh, uh, welfare, affirmative action, war on terror, uh, anything like that. And, where you, and depending on where you stood on it, you had to go against the one wall if you had basically the right opinion on it, and another wall if you had the wrong opinion on it. Now, that's not the way they put it, just like where do you stand on this? But it ultimately ended up being a public shaming of people with quote unquote the wrong points of view. There was also mandatory floor meetings in which the um, uh, in which you were actually required to fill out a questionnaire about what races and sexes you would date. A student who showed up, a female first year student, shows up um, uh, to, to this meeting. Um, it's a third year uh, male RA giving her this, so it's just creepy to begin with that, that she's, getting, she's given a questionnaire about what races and sexes she would date. And when she gets to the question about when did you discover your sexual orientation, keep in mind these are state employees prying into people's, into, into questions that parents often would you know, even ask their kids. And her, her response was appropriately, None of your damn business. <laughs> but she got written up. The university was patting itself on the back by, for the fact that they didn't actually punish her for that when I showed up. The, case, the, the program itself involved a, an administrator actually saying that this program should leave a quote unquote mental footprint on students. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Anybody know O'Brien from 1984? Imagine a, a, a foot crushing a human face, uh, face forever. Uh, the idea that someone would unwittingly quote 1984 and the bad guy and think it was a good thing is a pretty terrible thing. And, you know, and then there are just the, the, the uh, good old cases that someone mentioned. I, I just figured I'd work this case in here because I heard someone mentioning right to work initiatives. University of Cincinnati, this is a pretty recent case, um, had a free speech zone. It was 0.1% of a public campus. You needed 10 days advance state permission in order to use it. And when students uh, applied to uh, get a uh, petition, a, a right to work uh, petition signed, 
um, and they needed to do it before short of the 10 days, and they wanted to do it outside of the tiny free speech zone. Um, they were told that they couldn't petition the government for address of grievances, which also might sound familiar to some of you, and that they would be arrested for trespass if they were seen walking around campus. These are students at University of Cincinnati. And as bad as these cases are, and this one in particular, it's not just that these things happen and these things happen fairly regularly, it's that students don't care. And in this case, it's that a university, a, a paid employee of the state of Ohio, a paid uh, a lawyer for the state of Ohio, wanted, decided to go into court to defend the right of University of Cincinnati to keep free speech from 99% of campus. And unsurprisingly, they lost that case uh, pretty, pretty handily, pretty easily. So where is this coming from? Um, where, where, how, how did we get here? And the answer is, I, I don't entirely know. Um, certainly, political correctness is a huge part of it. Um, that's undeniable. Anybody who tells you otherwise is trying to fool you. Um, but, uh, but the two factors that don't get nearly enough attention, um, and the last one I'm going to be focusing a lot on for the rest of the speech, one is bureaucracy. Uh, in 2005, the number of people who are involved in administration full-time on campus <laughs> passed the number of people involved in instruction. And this is an average in universities all across the country. There are universities that have much, many more administrators than, uh, than instructors. Um, and this trend has only gotten worse. So what are you getting for your fifty to $60,000 a year? Fifty to $60,000 a year, I repeat. You are getting more administrators than ever. You are getting fewer due process rights, and in, in an awful lot of campuses, fewer free speech rights than any American would, uh, would put up with. So bureaucracy has a lot to do with it, but the other part of it is liability. And this is where we actually have to start if we want to start pushing, pushing back on this stuff. I will, I, I will actually say that I think to a degree, uh, university general counsels these days think it is probably a rational legal choice to censor students um, rather than let them speak. Partially because the likelihood of them getting sued for violating a student's First Amendment rights is actually relatively low. Uh, whereas the uh, likelihood of being sued for even a frivolous way for harassment or discrimination or for just someone being offended making up some kind of rationale is relatively common. Um, it's up to fire to, to reset these, um, uh, this, this balance. Um, so, and this goes back to the history of speech codes. Uh, from 1989 to about 1995, universities across the country passed uh, speech codes, which were for the most part harassment codes um, that banned offensive speech on the basis of race and sex. These were laughed at in the court of public opinion off of campus, and they were regularly defeated in the courts of law for 1989. The 95 case, by the way, was at Stanford. It was Robert Corey uh, v. Stanford. There was a special law passed so that um, uh, so you could go after even private schools that passed these kind of speech codes, and they lost. Um, Stanford lost and had to get rid of its speech code. Uh, funnily enough, when I started the law school two years later, nobody mentioned a thing to me about this embarrassing loss uh, at, at Stanford. Um, but the, the sad thing is that a lot of people remember this, or, uh, and then they kind of shrug their shoulders and, and say, well, thank goodness that, that's over, huh? Uh, even uh, uh, Bob, uh, Robert O'Neill, who's one of the big uh, uh, experts and former president of UVA of, of, of freedom of speech, claimed in one of his books that uh, speech codes died a, uh, a quiet death after that. Well, unfortunately, that's just not true. Um, in our latest study of nearly, I think it's 400, around 420 colleges um, across the country, we found that 59% of them uh, have codes that do not live up to First Amendment standards. Uh, and what do I mean by speech code? And so 59%, and believe it or not, that is a improvement. When we first started doing it, that it was 75%. 75. And, and that, those are really what we call red light speech codes. Red light speech codes can be roughly translated as laughably unconstitutional. The rest are, for the most part, are yellow light speech codes, which are just kind of probably unconstitutional. So what do I mean by speech codes? I'll give, give you some classic examples of codes that have been, uh, been around. Um, uh, one of my favorites uh, came out of the University of Connecticut, um, and it banned inappropriately directed laughter. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. 
<laughs> so this was it, you know, laughed at once again in the court of public opinion, or perhaps in an inappropriate direction as far as they were concerned. And it was defeated in an unpublished, I hate unpublished cases, I always have to say that whenever I mention that, but it was defeated at, at University of Connecticut in 1991. But to show you how tenacious these things are, and I have to explain, this happens all the time, but that code was defeated, again, in an embarrassing public loss. And Drexel University took the entire code and put it smack dab into its policies 10 years later. There is a certain kind of mindlessness to what, what's going on in some cases with these codes, and the fact that they are they're able to just um, uh, resuscitate themselves. So we defeated that, that code again. Another favorite code of mine <laughs> Was that it included psychological intimidation and harassment of person or pet. <laughs> I've never really understood the second half of that. But, but you even have things that, that involve sort of like uh, um, uh, codes that create a vague sense of unease. Things that, frankly, anybody, every student in the room has arguably violated, and students have gotten very, uh, very used to these kind of codes. And also, I want to, I want to emphasize, uh, for the first wave of speech codes uh, challenges uh, took place before FIRE was founded in 1999. Uh, we've since sort of picked up the flag and run with it to fight speech codes on campus. And now there's, you know, we're approaching about two dozen different lawsuits against, uh, successful lawsuits against speech codes over the years. Every single one of them has been successful. Yet 59% of colleges maintain uh, red light speech codes. Um, and that's you know, going to take a lot of work for, for it. And here's even worse news. As of last May, okay, so I will, I will say, say this. Uh, contrary to what, what you might expect, the federal government wasn't actually that, the most I can say is, that unhelpful when it came to speech codes. Even on the, under the Clinton administration, when the Office of Civil Rights and Department of Education talked about uh, what uh, harassment definitions are, they really emphasize the fact that they had to be in keeping with the First Amendment, um, that it wasn't just a right not to be offended, that it had to be a pattern of behavior. And under the Bush administration in 2003, they were very, very explicit. They wrote a letter of clarification saying, listen, harassment doesn't happen just every time someone's offended. We, we don't even have the power as the government to require that. We can't violate the First Amendment. We don't, we're, we're, we're prohibited from doing that, even at a private institution. We cannot actually require them to punish First Amendment protected speech. Very good statement in 2003. And for the, for the most part, it did away with universities' cowardly arguments that the government was making them do it. Um, really, the government basically said, you own these things. These are yours. Um, and if you pass them, you're not doing it because of us. And things were pretty good up until uh, last May, when the Department of Education, uh, now the definition of harassment that FIRE, and let's, let's be clear, FIRE is not saying that there is no such thing as harassment. We just think that the definition should mirror what the Supreme Court has said. You have a very controversial opinion that the uh, that state institutions should mirror what the Supreme Court says is our, is our position on harassment. And, that, and by that definition, uh, harassment is, uh, between students, it's severe, persistent, pervasive speech that is unwelcome, that's directed at an individual, um, that's objectively offensive. It's, put simply, harass, harassment, targeting someone and making them their lives miserable for discriminatory purposes. Not, you know, nothing, that definition does not threaten speech. That is a, that is a true definition of harassment. So th those are a lot of protections in there, you know, unwelcome, severe, persistent, pervasive, objectively and subjectively offensive. A lot of protections in the totality of circumstances. Um, also, you know, with all the First Amendment protection uh, uh, baked in there too. And ignoring all of that, the Department of Education and the Department of Justice uh, issued a letter to University of Montana in a sexual assault case, by the way. So they didn't have to get into redefining harassment, where they simply defined it as any unwelcome speech of a sexual nature. They got rid of every single protection that was in it. And keep in mind that, that uh, if, it, if that's the definition of harassment, that doesn't just mean flirting. That will apply to any speech about gender, any speech about ethnicity, and for whatever reason, any speech about ethnicity also translates to race, but also religion, strangely enough. That suddenly, that basically meant that you, really the government was mandating a right not to be offended on college campuses. So we've been fighting this uh, for uh, uh, for you know almost a year now, and believe it or not, we've actually had some success fighting it. 
we got the Department of Education to, to write me, which was kind of cool, um, saying, no, 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 we actually mean, uh, mean a speech productive standard and, and, and backtracking on an awful lot of this. But I know that universities are now going to turn around and say, see, the government really is making us do it. And now, actually, and they, they can say that with a straight face. So unfortunately, I think things are about to get um, even worse. So what can we do? Litigation. Um, FIRE has primarily fought uh, for, for free speech and due process and sanctity of conscience and freedom of religion on college campuses through the power of public, um, uh, uh, public scrutiny. Which means that when a, one, one of these cases comes up, um, when an evangelical Christian student, uh, you know, we actually had this case at the University of Wisconsin, an evangelical Christian student was told that he could not have a Bible study meeting in his own room on his own time. Yeah. And then I, I, I've almost gotten used to these kind of cases. Almost. And uh, we, when the way we fought that primarily was by uh, press releases, was by first telling the university it needs to do the right thing, and then fighting it out in the press. Um, but unfortunately now that I think that a lot of it is not just that the true believers have won, but that we have a mid-level administrators who are just sort of carrying out um, these policies without really even thinking them through, you have to start resetting the incentives. And universities have to understand that they will pay a price for it. Uh, part of that strategy was actually to pierce what's called qualified immunity and get someone to pay out of their pockets, personally. And we achieved that in a case involving a university president who, yes, kicked a student out of school for a collage he posted on Facebook. <laughs> it's the case that opens up on learning liberty. It's, again, that I could spend the entire time talking about it. It's a crazy, crazy case. Um, but in that case, we actually pierce qualified immunity. And that's been part of a, a very long uh, approach by FIRE in which we write universities. We send them certified mail uh, uh, letters to both the university president and to the general counsel saying, you are in violation of the Constitution. And guess what? You're now on actual notice, which means the standard for finding uh, uh, qualified immunity pierce is now lowered. Ha. And the nice thing is these are starting to get cited in cases. They got cited in the University of Cincinnati case, for example. So litigation. But we need students. We need students who are willing to challenge their schools. And unfortunately, when you're paying $60,000 a year to go to a college, a lot of times you're hesitant to actually challenge that school. Um, I am trying to point out to them that it is actually, if you're going to be a, you're, you're going to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit, you want to be in a facial constitutional challenge. It's about as easy to, uh, to be a student in one of these challenges as it is to be, as can be, as, and still be a plaintiff. And these students have won, um, and if universities were to retaliate against these students, they'd only succeed in making those students wealthy. It would be crazy um, for, for universities to go after them. And actually, I point out to students all the time, you are much, much uh, uh, more in danger if you uh, keep your uh, uh, concerns to yourself. Um, if you're not actually out in the public spotlight, that's when they can, not to sound too paranoid, but that's when they can get you. Uh, we also need legislation. Um, uh, we're, we, we are so, uh, we were slow to get to litigation because we didn't. We wanted to solve these things in the court of public opinion, and we have largely won in one of that. Uh, but legislation, you know, things as simple as actually having Congress say this is the definition of harassment would eliminate, um, uh, you know, maybe forty percent of speech goes in one fell swoop. And amazingly, when we go to talk to people on the Hill about this, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they think that sounds perfectly reasonable. Um, believe it or not, uh, I was actually shocked by how reasonable I found Washington, D.C. because I'm used to actually working on campuses all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you a little perspective there. So the other ways to, to address this are, 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 is awareness. Um, and I think, and that's why I wrote the book, frankly. I got really sick of coming up with examples and, you know, having seen thousands of examples like this and having fought hundreds of cases over the of people saying, oh, well, that's just one example. So, you know, I took a hundred of them, put them in the book, um, had, you know, have an additional thousands for people to look at if they want to, um, and make the argument that it's not cute. It's not no big deal that these uh, wacky, zany PC police on campus are, are punishing students. It actually matters, and it harms us all. Um, and I think that people need to understand that. I'd also like to turn this into a documentary. I think it's kind of amazing that there hasn't been a documentary on the history of political correctness. Yeah. I think there needs to 
be. And ultimately, the goal here is to change the culture. That's what you need more than anything else. You need to, if the First Amendment exists, if free speech exists only as a legalism, it's not too long for this world. It has to be something that's understood in the hearts and minds of individual citizens and students. So how can, how can we change the culture, though? I mean, it's kind of funny. I have one, one of the founders of FIRE is always saying, we need to change the culture. And like, we are up against a half a trillion dollar uh, industry. <laughs> so this is, a, this is no small task. But one, you know, uh, alumni make a huge difference. Believe it or not, when we have a case, when even a single donor to a college calls them up, um, they notice that uh, when they're having a bad case. And so sometimes alumni think there's nothing they can do. It is not true. A handful of alumni can really help us win these cases. Um, we want to actually start reaching out to, to high schools. Because university, because high school students, frankly, you know, they don't, you don't have a ton of rights in K through 12, and there's some, you know, some, some decent reasons for that to a degree, and that's actually the nature of the law too, that you have, you know, very few rights if you're a kindergartner, and not all that many if you're in high school, but universities take advantage of that fact and not tell students that they're actually headed towards a fundamentally different showdown, that that, that they're expected to be part of the great discussion. And we want, and that's one of the reasons why they fall suckers to these speech codes, and, they, uh, and that, they're, uh, that, that they'll go through this um, you know, like University of Delaware program without actually thinking anything's wrong. So I want to uh, start reaching out to high schools and start educating uh, students about their rights, but not just their rights, not just the legal aspect of it, but why it's one of the most brilliant systems for human growth, innovation, and change, and freedom that we've ever come up with. Free speech is one of the great innovations of human history, and it cannot be underappreciated. So, and uh, then also we need to teach debate. We need to actually have uh, uh, we need to actually have debates on college campuses. We need to. I think that rather than having some of these different orientation programs, having students show up and say, "Listen, we're doing an Oxford-style debate on healthcare." <laughs> They wouldn't do it right now, under, under uh, administrators would have no inclination to do something like that. Um, when, I, when I brought up this idea, when I went and spoke at Harvard, Harvard, uh, this time last year, I had a student come up to me afterwards and say, yeah, I've been trying to do debates at Harvard for, for, for a year now, but every time I try to put one together, they're saying, well, we can't actually debate anything controversial because we can't have someone taking the other side of that. <laughs> So even debates on college campuses is an, up, is an uphill battle, um, but, but we shouldn't give up on it. It's, it. And it's funny, because as much as like people might believe in, 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 in PC, it's hard to actually bring up this very reasonable idea of having an actual debate to an administrator and watching them try to squirm out of it. Um, most of them understand that this is a good thing, and as soon as you actually introduce debate, it actually, it, 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 it one, empowers students that words can't, you know, don't, don't harm them nearly as much as they think. And it's very hard to, to, uh, to think of people who disagree with you as caricatures of social evil if you actually take a minute to try to figure out where they're coming from. And I think that this all leads to probably the simple, well, the simplest cultural fix is teaching students that they should see it as a duty of educated people to seek out the educated, the intelligent person they disagree with. They should see that as a duty. That's what educated people should do. But guess what? According to the research that I found, there is a negative correlation between how much uh, education you have and how many political disagreements you have in your average month. In other words, if you have a high school diploma um, or at no more, or, or uh, you have the most political disagreements in a week, and if you have a PhD, you have the fewest. That should not be happening. If we had actual, if we had people who were committed to being educated intellectuals, they would think of it as a duty to understand where the other side was coming from, not just to surround themselves with people who agree with them. So we have to get back to some some relatively old-fashioned values, but I think that um, when, when it comes to and I mean by that intellectual values, um, but I do think that if we were just to teach the idea of seeking out the intelligent person we disagree with, we could go a long way. Uh, we have, and we have to fight uh, to restore free speech on campus because as uh, Fire co-founder once said, um, a nation that does not educate liberty will not long endure in liberty and will not even know when it is lost. Thanks.
open the floor now for our Q and A period, and there should be cards being distributed amongst you. So if you have a question uh, for Gary, jot it down, and we'll ask you about them. Thanks. Oh, I'm also assigning copies of my book. Um, all royalties of the book, by the way, go to Fire, not not to me. So please, you know, by buying the book and telling people about it, you're supporting uh, free speech on campus. I hear it. While we're waiting for the cars to come back, I'm going to open things up with a question. So, over time, students who have successfully unlearned liberty are becoming adults and judges. Yep. Do you perceive any danger that the courts will evolve to become less friendly to your position? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I am very worried about that. The, the, the good news is, right now, the courts are quite good on freedom of speech. Um, and, but I think that that's uh, spreading a little bit of, of complacency. Um, that the Supreme Court, you know, ha hasn't uh, made any exception for, you know, even particularly offensive speech, which I'm, which I'm happy about. At the same time, the Roberts Court gets a lot of credit for being good on speech. They do tend to be fairly deferential to power at the same time, and there are some opinions I could name, you know, name on that that, that, that have me a little worried. So I can see things getting a lot worse, particularly considering how bad um, the, the state of legal education is when it comes to freedom of speech. I mean, it's, it's so funny, like, like the... It, it, I was considered, even in 1999, sort of a contrarian at Stanford for being pro, pro free speech. I was even, someone explained to me about, oh, you're pro free speech, that's really paternalistic of you. I'm like, what? <laughs> and the argument was that I was imposing freedom of speech on people, and I'm like, wow, imposing, okay, we're in trouble. All right, I'm going to rephrase one that I got from the audience here. Uh, do you perceive more strongly from either the left or the right a, a tendency to want to restrict free speech? Uh, on, on campuses? I mean, campuses are run overwhelmingly by people who are left and center, so absolutely, like most of what I fight is, um, uh, uh, is uh, the political correctness itself, you know, is pretty much considered to be sort of like an animal of, of, the, of the left side of the spectrum. And I make, and I make no bones about it in the book, you are more likely to get in trouble for socially conservative positions on campus. Um, now, that being said, when people get in trouble for liberal positions, fire is always there to defend them. Um, I do get disappointed sometimes, though, when someone who will be tearing us up, you know, like on the internet for defending an evangelical Christian group, when one of their friends gets in trouble, is suddenly like, fire's great. <laughs> Can you offer an example of a campus that actively promotes freedom of speech? Mm. Great question. Um, University of Virginia has actually done a pretty good job over the years. Um, University UVA actually worked with FIRE to get rid of its speech code, and they've had some controversies involving um, even uh, you know, fairly offensive speech, and they haven't tried to shut it down. So UVA has been pretty well behaved. Um, James Madison University, uh, actually for some reason a lot of schools in Virginia have been pretty well behaved. Um, so for years I used to do a, uh, so I used to go a lot more where I do this, but the, I, I've been doing a um, worst and best schools for freedom of speech list in the Huffington Post. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny because you know, I'll get like grumpy people being like, how oh, are you doing that, you know, liberal rag, I'm like, do you think they're going to care if it's in the National Review? They hate seeing that list in the Huffington Post. And we, we did it this year right before Christmas, so it's kind of our little gift to them. <laughs> How would you compare the students struggling for their First Amendment rights today with the free speech movement of 1960s Berkeley? Oh, the ironies abound. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fun video uh, at thefire.org. Um, that's the website for, for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. We do a lot of videos that include interviews with the founders, Alan Charles Kors and Art Silverblade. Really, we would love to hear uh, you to watch them um, or listen to them. Um, but there's one with Donald Downs who talks about, um, you know, some of the uh, people in the Berkeley free speech movement and about how, um, you know, like even days after some of the major uh, battles were won, you had actual, you know, members saying, it's like, yeah, we believe in free speech, but not for the view, point of view that disagrees with ours. <laughs> now, my overall take on it is a little, a little bit more up, a little bit more positive about the free speech movement. 
um, at, at Berkeley because I actually do to this day um, run into a lot of people who were true believers then and are true believers now. They're still really good at it. Uh, Nat Hentoff, you know, for example, is a huge fan of fires and a, and a very <laughs> consistent defender of, of freedom of speech on college campuses. Um, but the problem is it, the, those true believers that I run into and that are oftentimes fire donors, um, you, you know, very much oftentimes came from, from the left part of the perspective, but still believe in free speech even for opinions they, they disagree with, they're largely off campus. It seems like the people who stayed on campus to a large degree started going, wait a second, we're in charge now. And suddenly I'm noticing I don't really like it if it really disagrees with me. And uh, watching that sort of qualified, you know, appreciation for free speech, and in some cases outright hostility, can be really depressing. How would you suggest a parent discuss the issue of free speech with their adult children? It's like after school special. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great suggestion. We actually wrote a guide to freedom of speech on campus. Um, uh, it, it, that uh, I actually wrote when I was recovering from surgery <laughs> back in like 2003. So I, I was amazed when I read it again that it was coherent. Um, I, you know, it's one of these things where. You, you have to explain the philosophy of freedom of speech first, and, and I think it helps to explain where, where it comes from and how much of an innovation it was. But I usually start from, uh, you know, try, try to make sure that this makes sense to a, a generation. And, you know, say, uh, say with you, there's a lot to, there's a lot to be criticized about the, you know, you know, the younger generation. But I do think that while they can be mocked for it, the concentration on being nice and uh, being kind to a fall is not something that's you know, it's fundamentally coming from a good place. I think it just gets warped and somewhat taken advantage of. But partially from that point of view, but also because this is how the view I come from, it, I recognize that free speech defenders, First Amendment lawyers, we can all come off as incredibly arrogant and incredibly pushy. But ultimately, what we're arguing for is epistemic humility. We believe that I'm not omniscient, and probably none of you are either. So you'll probably have to hear out what you have to say. I could be wrong, and even if I'm not wrong, um, I will get to learn about why I believe what I believe. Otherwise, I hold my beliefs as if uh, I, I was holding a prejudice. Um, that I know what I believe, but I don't know why. And I, when I challenge students with that on, on campuses, and this is John Stuart Mill speaking that line, um, that uh, I, I, I challenge students. So, so how many students do you know who know entirely what they believe politically and know where they stand in every issue, but can't explain why? That hits a court. So I say start with philosophy. Um, I also, you know, I also go back to history and I point out. I, I mean, oh, so I have to explain this. Um, I, I wrote an article uh, uh, about the push for blasphemy laws in, in the wake of the Benghazi attacks. There was a, there was a big backlash against freedom of speech when people were still blaming that video for, for leading to the Benghazi attacks. And it led to a bunch of professors to finally say publicly what we knew that they were saying among themselves, which is, I told you the First Amendment is a terrible thing and it goes too far. And I had to take this apart. I could not believe it. Well, I could believe it, but I, I was just glad that they made the argument out open. And I made the point that the way you historically had, the, most societies dealt with dissenters or blasphemers was to behead them burn them, arrest them, um, otherwise do away with them in some way. That's historic, that's history, nor, uh, that, that's normal history. Um, the idea of actually listening to them was an incredible innovation, and from that we got the scientific revolution, we got the democratic revolution, we got all the, you know, uh, forgive the expression, but the, the name liberal revolution, it's a scientific revolution. You know, as Jonathan Rauch calls it, you know, capitalism, uh, democracy, and, uh, and you know, uh, what he calls uh, liberal science, which is essentially the idea of hearing everybody out and debating things through rather than letting power uh, uh, power or an elite decide. These are powerful ideas. A follow-up to an earlier question. Why do you suppose it is that the left has uh, decided, tries to restrict free speech rather than the right? You know, partially coming from a historical perspective on all this stuff, um, I think that the, I really do think the, uh, it, it's kind of human nature to want to censor, and it takes a lot of sort of intellectual discipline to, um, uh, to, to hear the other side out. 
Um, I think that right now, one of the reasons why you end up having more push for censorship on sort of the left side of the spectrum is because of uh, different ideas, particularly starting out in, in the 80s, uh, first popularized by people like Herbert Marcuse, um, who believed that uh, tolerance was not enough. That we actually, if we wanted a just society, we had to go much, much farther, and we had to actually root out um, a, a offensive speech. And this uh, this argument uh, took hold of campuses. Uh, now, don't misunderstand. I, I'm not someone who believes that uh, a, a thinker thinks something and then it becomes reality in some kind of a vacuum. It became reality because it was also convenient for people on campus. They didn't like some of the opinions they were hearing, and in some cases, they were. You know, when when you hear genuinely racist vitriol. Um, I understand why people recoil at that. Uh, I just don't believe that the way you answer that is through censorship. I think there's a value in knowing what people actually think, even if sometimes what they really think is horrible. But when you have such power on campuses, when you have such groupthink going on, when you have so many people agreeing with you, it's very easy to think of people who actually have different points of view as blasphemers, idolaters, or basically people who must, uh, must be stopped. So, and to be clear, it's not as if uh, there isn't an, an urge to censor all over the political spectrum, just on campuses, it's, you know, overwhelmingly campuses are, are dominated by one side of the spectrum. But still, you know, I, I definitely, uh, when we defend different cases, uh, since fire relates defend everybody, it can be really disappointing when you're defending, you know, someone on the left and suddenly someone who, who totally got free speech when it was an opinion they disagreed with will say, well, not so fast if it's something I really, really dislike. Does your website list offending universities so alumni can monitor and follow up with the university administrations? Yes, it does. <laughs> we have a very cool function called Spotlight um, in which uh, you can look up about, I think we're pushing 450 universities, where we uh, highlight their speech codes, we list them according to what, or what are red light, yellow light, or green light codes, um, and then we also list if we've had a fire case there that went public, um, you can find out a lot about your universities, and I gotta tell you, you know, I'm a Stanford alum. Stanford's been, we've had some bad cases at Stanford over the years, but they've been much better behaved than, say, Harvard or Yale. I, I, I actually created partially because I was getting sick of, you know, sort of elitist types, sort of saying, "Well, sure, this happened at Modesto Junior College, but yeah. this doesn't happen at a place that matters, like Harvard or Yale." <laughs> so I wrote a whole chapter about how much this happens at Harvard and Yale. <laughs> How and when will you introduce free speech issues into high schools? Well, we already started by uh, what I think is probably the best bang for our buck approach that we've done is that we did a video explaining free speech rights to um, high school students, and then we uh, did one about you know uh, fire cases, so they know kind of like you know when when something's gone wrong, so they have some clue about like wh what an abuse looks like. And then we attached it to, this was donated, uh, we got $20,000 of scholarship money to give away um, by a very generous donor. And we um, uh, did a scholarship contest, uh, and we've done it for years. And that's gotten us in touch with a good something like 20,000 high schools across, across the country. So that's how we started actually getting to know high school students. So now that we actually know which places have, um, since we have a little bit of a foothold and people have heard of us, uh, some of the stuff that we want to do is um, to uh, address, to actually go and speak at some of the like, particularly more influential high schools, including like the Andovers and Exeters and that kind of stuff. And we're working on that right now. Um, but it's also, it goes very much hand in hand with the idea of doing uh, more video uh, to be able to actually, I want to do this feature doc. I want to. <coughs> You know, it, it seems wacky, but I want to do more animation. I want to explain some of this higher level philosophy behind it um, so students don't get left flat-footed when someone's saying, yeah, but that speech is me. Um, so I think that you know, through a combination of good video content, um, combining it with scholarships to college and that kind of stuff, we can actually um, have breadth. And by actually engaging students at places like Andover, uh, Exeter and also, you know, I'm sure there are schools in Menlo Park that we should we should reach out to too. We also want to have uh, depth. We also there was one program that we really wanted to get funding for and we haven't gotten it yet, which we just called internally. We will come up with a better name for it, but the boot camp, uh, which is essentially a program that teaches students all about you know sort of sort of these classical rights um, right before they head off to college. We've received several copies of different versions of this question, so I'm going to paraphrase from each. 
There's a, a, a prominent case in the news nearby where high school students at, at a local high school uh, were asked on Cinco de Mayo not to wear American flags on their shirts for fear that they would offend people who didn't like the flag for whatever reason. Is this something that would be of interest to you? Would you consider a case like that? We only wouldn't for, for a very technical reason, which is that fire deals with, with um, higher education. The, the extent to which we'd be reaching out to high schools would be to prepare them to be not to be suckered uh, by the time they get to to um, uh, to college. That being said, since I started at fire, I have been passionately pushing for there to be a separate, can't be the same organization because I don't want to dilute the effectiveness of fire, but there needs to be the equivalent of fire for high schools. And it's so funny, I have mentioned this, I, I, I said, like, this is the way I put it, it's like, this needs to happen, and it needs the right person to be in charge of it, because that's the way you actually get a good nonprofit, is you find the people first who are of passion for this. And if you decide to do this, I will get behind you and push, if you're the right person. And so far, you know, only like one person over like 10 years of me saying this has like gotten back to me and been kind of like, I want to help with this. And then they just kind of dropped the ball on it. Um, this still needs to exist. I, and again, if it happened, I would be really thrilled to help out. Now, that case, we do talk about high school cases on the blog, for example, and the one, uh, the, the Ninth Circuit, so, so, so you know, the, the, the Ninth Circuit decided that, um, uh, that it was legitimate for a school to ban American flag t-shirts on Cinco de Mayo because they were resulting in, in, in fights. And as Eugene Bullock, you know, spoke at our, he was a First Amendment scholar, uh, you know, graduated from UCL Law School, I think when he was like 15, uh, literally. Um, he, uh, uh, he pointed out, this is, that's classic heckler's veto. When he went, uh, not only is it like horrifying that it's actually, you know, patriotic displays, but it's also saying, hey, you know what, if you don't like speech on your, uh, speech at high school, threaten it with violence. We should reward that behavior. That's crazy. And so, like everybody at Fire is all all up in arms about about this uh, that decision. And there has to be there needs to be a fire for for uh, for high schools. Have you seen a notice, noticeable difference between public universities and private universities in terms of their support of free speech, or how amenable they are to to your advice? Weirdly. Oh, no, not really. And we've always found this bizarre because you know I didn't go into this because it always comes up in the questions. But um, public uh, public schools, high schools, or universities are bound by the First Amendment, kind of directly. Technically, it's through the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, but they're they're bound to follow the protections of the First Amendment. Private colleges uh, and high schools are not. But Fire's position on them is if you promise freedom of speech. At a uh, uh, at a private college, and the overwhelming majority of them do. They promise it to high heaven. You should deliver at the same degree that you would get at the uh, public college down the road. That's what they're expecting. They're American citizens, and if you say we promise free speech to high heaven, like Yale and Harvard and so many other colleges do, you should get free speech. Or they should have the nerve to tell every every alum and every incoming faculty member and every potential donor. Um, that uh, that they do not uh, that they place uh, their definition of, of civility um, and politeness above uh, above freedom of speech. Does Fire work with student organizations such as Students for Liberty, Young Amer Americans for Liberty, the Federalist Society, and so forth? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Fire in general, it, we're, we're very pragmatic in the sense that we work with anybody who. Um, work with us. And that even means that you know, we'll forge alliances of, with people that we wouldn't agree with on other cases. But if they want to work with us on a particular case where we think it will free speech or due process or, or religious liberty will benefit, we will work together with, with, with anybody who wants to achieve that. Uh, that being said, you know, like the, it was funny, there was someone here tonight who saw me um, on C-SPAN when I was doing a book TV um, event when, when, the, when the hardcover version of the book first came out. And that was talking to Students for Liberty. Um, I really, did, I like them a lot. Like, I actually personally like the students involved with that program. And I also like just how, how committed they are. Like, they're, um, sometimes, you know, some people refer to themselves as libertarians, but they're not actually, you know, they're sort of fair weather <laughs> libertarians. So it's for Liberty is, is, a, is an impressive group that I actually get along with quite well. The student at um, uh, Modesto Junior College was also a member of, of Young Americans for Liberty. Um, so we work with them in a lot of cases too. And in some cases, frankly, YL members have been fire plans.
But we do actually, I mean, we, we, we do make a point though. We go to libertarian student groups. I speak, uh, I speak federalist groups all the time, but I'm also proud of the fact that I, we, we, we don't just want to talk to the people who agree with us. There's no, you know, that feels great, um, but it doesn't, but ultimately it's not necessarily all that good for you. So, you know, we, we have been very successful in getting uh, discussions that involve both the Federalists and the American Constitution Society, kind of a liberal, liberal counterpart to the Federalists. We're always really trying to make sure that we're not just preaching to the choir. You are now. <laughs> 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 not <from> just. <laughs> you, you quoted poll numbers. Uh, for people of various age groups, over 60, 30 to 59, yep. 18 to 30. Yep. Uh, the question here asserts those over 60 were just as liberal 40 to 50 years ago as today's students. Uh -huh. Do people change as they mature? Do people change? Is, is there a glimmer of hope there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I don't know. Um, I, because I, I, I think that starting out being skeptical of, uh, of power um, and, you know, the sort of like natural sort of insubordination that Thomas Jefferson would talk about is kind of more the norm. When you start out believing that power can ultimately solve all things, I'm not totally sure that you, uh, you, you know, definitely I think with, with students um, seeing the way it works in the real world, that can produce a, a fair amount of apathy over time. But I'm a little bit worried that there's a lot of deference to authority, a lot of um, wanting to be like a good little boy or girl um, in, in, in the current generation that really power could take huge advantage of and, it, and they could keep that monopoly for a long time. I, I don't think that, you know, I, I don't think that some enlightened principles are, uh, it's, a, it's complicated how to put this, but I, I think that they require discipline and I think they require commitment and they're not, it's not an easy road. And I think that human nature, well, that's what I mean by sort of the, um, I, I talk, to, talk to libertarian groups a lot of times, and I do end up slightly disagreeing with um, sort of libertarian optimism on my particular topics. Because I'm very bullish on science. I am very bullish on a lot of things about, uh, and, and when people are getting too pessimistic, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna give you some perspective here. My father was born in 1926 in Yugoslavia. You cannot tell me the world has not improved. <laughs> That being said, I do think that um, while we can expect science, and I think people will live longer, and I think you know we'll be healthier in a lot of different ways, and we'll cure all sorts of diseases, and I'm very excited for that. Um, I think that there's an entire subset of problem that's going to get worse, and I refer to these as problems of comfort. Uh, a problem of comfort that's very you know obvious is obesity, like the idea that kind of like if you can eat as much delicious food as you want, your society is going to get fatter. That's just going to happen. Um, but I, what I'm afraid of is that we're also creating an expectation of intellectual and psychological comfort. And there's no bottom to that pit. If you're taught that you have a right not to be offended or not to, have, not to be disagreed with or not to ever be psychologically hurt and the uh, rubric by which you judge that is the most sensitive person in the room, that's a downward slope. And telling people um, as much as you want, saying, Listen, it's really good for you to be offended. Fire tells people that. Like, we're one of the only organizations that's like, actually, being offended with what happens when you have your deepest beliefs challenged, and if you make it through four years of college without having your deepest beliefs challenged, you should ask for your money back. <laughs> but that's, you know, that takes discipline. That, 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 that's a different way of thinking about the world. That's not, that, I don't I think, uh, something that actually really has to be taught, and I don't think universities are doing it. So I'm a, I'm a little bit, I think that the, the role of sort of the, the, the free speech defender is only going to get more important. I've got a copy of an email allegedly from a local principal of a high school uh, to the students saying, I've been informed by the local athletic league that the administration of the other school, a school with whom they are rivals, interprets uh, a tire with the, the uh, letters USA on it as a way of saying, you suck a blank blank to our opponents. As a result, this kind of theme attire will not be allowed from this point forward in any future contests, and any student tired that way will not be allowed in the gym. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> someone actually sent me this, sent me that right before, someone who was here tonight sent me that right before, and I just, as I said, I've been doing this for, you know, 13 years now, and I like, and you think I, nothing ever surprises me, but it just, it just blows me away. Um, 
Uh, yeah, t teaching, w where do you even begin when, 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 when that's possible? Like the idea that you could actually potentially imply a crude joke through something sort of kind of is reason for banning it. You know, that, that's unlearning liberty. What do you see as the typical punitive damages to universities who do violate the First Amendment rights of their students? That, that's a great question, and unfortunately the damages are very low. The way you actually create a real consequence is through attorney's fees. Um, I have been wondering, um, partially because like when you have a, when you have a student who, uh, like uh, Robert Van Toynen and at, at, um, Modesto, you know, there's just so many, many damages other than attorney's fees you can, you can argue. It's not like he was put out of work, it's not like he was, um, uh, you, you know, beaten up or anything like that, and, um, and so you end up with a relatively modest amount of damages. I'm trying to think of ways to make the penalty greater. Um, and even if you were to go with like legislation that allowed for trouble damages, which is sometimes a remedy for situations like this, the damages would still not be that great. Um, but you have to figure out a way to make sure that the consequences are relatively high. That's one of the reasons why we fell down on um, uh, on qualified immunity. Because in, in, when it comes to qualified immunity, you can actually pierce through, and you know, a big institution paying, you know, fifty thousand dollars is you know one student's um, check for uh, for a year. Um, a individual having to pay that out of their own pocket is something quite different. Um, so I think that there, there's ways to rejigger it so that you can have uh, bigger consequences for universities that abuse these rights, but there's also ways to make it be more effective and more targeted too. And, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we, we've, we've somewhat regrettably had to, had to have a, a presence on the Hill in order to make arguments for resetting the incentives to favor rather than disfavor free speech. Is there any way we can help you make your documentary? <laughs> uh, donate to fire. Um, the, I mean, to, it, it, we are the hardest working little nonprofit out there. Like it's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. I'm very, you know, the fact that you know we come early and stay late is something that uh, I, I've just always, you know, it, it's something that makes me very proud. And it's nice that even since we've been around for a long time, um, to still see an entire, you know, new generation of people staying late and and, and uh, you know, to tell their friends about these cases that we fight and just you know, want, you know, having the having the forgive the pun, but fire in their belly. Um, we have a particular documentarian that we want to. Um, that, uh, that we want to work with and we've worked with over the, over the years. Um, and getting students to, uh, uh, to sit down for interviews is, is, is helpful too. And, and if, if y'all know anybody at like the History Channel or, uh, or, or A&E, like, I, don't, I don't want to make a documentary that nobody watches. Um, and uh, so de definitely be in touch. I'm, I'm Greg at thefire.org. Um, the, uh, I, I want this to be something that, because it, 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 if you don't see these students for yourself, sometimes it can be hard to believe this stuff. But that's one of the reasons why I've been I've spent years putting together an HD library that includes student after student after student looking at the camera and saying, "Hi, my name is Chris Lee, and I was kicked out, uh, or, or sorry, out of the university uh, punished me because I made a, a musical that they didn't like, which is a real case, and just one after the other after the other after the other." Um, to, to, to just to you know, uh, stop once and for all anybody trying to say that this isn't happening. It's happening way too often, and students know it. They know it so well that they're actually reporting that it's not safe to hold in popular positions on campus. This organization has a special relationship with Hillsdale College in Michigan. We're wondering, are, are you aware of Hillsdale, and uh, do you know if they have any kind of free speech codes that would be of concern? You know, I, we haven't had a, had a case in Hillsdale. Um, I've never been to Hillsdale, though. Um, the, uh, well, I, I hear a lot about it, um, but I haven't met too many people from it, which is kind of weird, because I, I meet a lot of people um, uh, in, in this line of work. Uh, where is it? What's the actual location? Of it? So, <laughs> 50 miles south of Ann Arbor. Got it. Okay. i got to go there. Yeah. Right. 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 Check it out. Since schools receive government funds through taxpayer dollars, can they be required to have students take a class on the Constitution each year, and the staff required to be diverse? If not, can they be sued based on discrimination? Um, could they be required to have a class on the Constitution? Definitely. Could they require the, the, uh, the, the, the staff to be intellectually diverse? You'd probably start to get some lawsuits. Um, 
but what's interesting about it is that you know sometimes when I talk to different libertarian groups, when we talk about um, attaching you know other conditions to, uh, to to the federal support of, of student loans, they're like, no, no, you can't do that. And I have to point out the problems we're fighting come from the fact that a lot of these these uh, policies were attached on to student loans going back to the uh, going back to the seventies. Going back to um, because the, the 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 harassment law that universities are uh, enforcing, even though they're over enforcing it, um, it d does go back to uh, things that are attached to student loans. So it, the, it it's one of these things where it's kind of like you know the, the, the government is already very much involved in it, and you know to a large degree they're making things worse. So sometimes we wonder. We would like. I mean, Fire's overall position. We're we're we're, we're pro liberty enough that like the idea of having like a a rule that said you know if you accept student loans you have to actually live up to First Amendment standards. We don't like that idea because that's too top down and that and that that kind of goes against a lot of what we believe. But at the same time, given that that's already happening, we're not sure if that would, if that would be at least better than the current situation we have. Do you think that the evolution of technology, such as social media and cyber stalking, has resulted in uh, changes to speech codes or increased speech codes? I think that's a I think that's a great question, and I think it's actually a really complicated relationship. Um, I think that uh, I, I think on the one hand, um, the ability to know what people are actually saying to each other, well, the, the ability to, you know. Pick someone out and make uh, and, and tweet at them and Facebook stalk them and all this kind of stuff does uh, bring it home for a lot of parents in particular how, how creepy the, the the cyberverse can be. Um, at the same time, you know, like I'm a big fan of Twitter, and I think we're going to end up. I think you know, global laws uh, both in, inside and outside of the United States are going to ultimately kill Twitter to a large degree, um, which makes me very sad because what we're Giving up on is probably the the, the rawest opportunity to see, and this is going to sound grandiose, but I mean it, the sort of collective unconscious of the entire planet. People tweet what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're joking about. It, it's almost like that, like that they're, they're they're tweeting their thoughts, and if you follow Twitter, you get to see this all go, going around. And then you'll have people have this movement, you know, like Europe in particular, trying to like shut down offensive tweets. I'm like, wait a second, we have an opportunity to see yeah. what people actually think and say, and we want to shut that down. Yeah. This is unparalleled opportunity to see what we actually are. Um, and I think we're going to end up end up harming it. Meanwhile, I've seen far fewer cases. Now, Facebook has just become part of sort of like the, the ecosystem. Um, the students get in trouble for what they put on Facebook all the time, and Fire comes in and defends them. Um, they think it's private, and sometimes they're students, they're, sometimes they're Facebook quote unquote friends will turn them in to the administration. Uh, we've had a, number, a case uh, like that at Cornell that just drives me nuts, where a student was complaining about, um, uh, uh, well, I, uh, uh, that's a case that's actually at the fire network too, but it's hard to believe. Um, and so, and Facebook has, has largely sort of um, uh, given in, in, you know, to to, to this. And Facebook is, is pretty, uh, you know, people who want to stop bullying have gone overboard. In some cases, it's really easy to get trouble for Facebook. Meanwhile, universities haven't been trying as hard to go after what people tweet, and I think there's, there's a reason for that. In 140 characters, it's really hard to tell if someone's kidding. If someone's being using multiple levels of irony, like students often do, um, if they're saying the exact opposite of what they mean, it's hard to tell. You have to give this weird thing called the benefit of the doubt to what someone's saying, something that we don't really do all that much anymore. Or you at least have to ask yourself, do I really know what this person is saying? So I think that the nature of Twitter has um, prompted some, what I consider to be kind of good intellectual habits on the part of people who are trying to police it. So I think that just the scale and scope of it causes some administrators to go, well, we don't really understand what they're saying, and it's too big to police anyway. But amazingly, despite that you know, great educative function, there are still college administrators out there who really think Twitter must be stopped because someone might be offended. Do you perceive a role, either potential or actual, for student newspapers to be involved in this discussion 
absent, and perhaps for alumni to encourage the student newspapers on campus to, to participate in this? Absolutely, that's a great question. I, I love student newspapers. Um, that, that's uh, the best First Amendment people you're going to meet, um, and uh, most of the, one, the ones I can think of, um, I'm going to include myself in this, we, we got started on student newspapers. And there's a reason why you become a First Amendment purist if you work for a student newspaper. <laughs> because the first time someone comes into your office and they're like, I don't know why you shouldn't have published that article that I didn't like, but hold on, hold on. Let's see, what, what, what are my options? Like, the, watching the, the wheels turn in people's head, you're like, oh my god, we're natural born censors. Like, we actually want to figure out ways to shut each other down. It's really good that we take this entirely off the map. We actually say, no, 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 you're not allowed to, it doesn't matter what rationale you come up with, you're not allowed to, uh, to punish me for that article I wrote that you didn't like. Um, and, the student press has been uh, really valuable allies to FIRE. We've been very uh, very protective of the student press. There's also, my second favorite nonprofit is a nonprofit called the Student Press Law Center, who we work with all the time, uh, who are fantastic. I would, but I would love, we, we go to the, uh, communicate, uh, the uh, Campus Media Advisors Conference every year. I would love to work more with student newspapers. I think that they're a really valuable um, uh, ally. I am a little bit worried, though, that universities are have gotten very skilled at being able to quietly deal with student newspapers that um, uh, that, that dissent uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily um, uh, rise to the level of censorship. Um, and I think that university and, and that uh, in, in that sense, they, they some, to some degree take advantage of the uh, the, the niceness of, of, of the current generation. But I would very much love to work more with student newspapers. I think they play a, a vital, vital role. I see Jerry by your side. Jerry, are we out of time for questions here? Sorry, say that again. Are we out of time for questions? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can ask him as you buy his book. He's going to sign the book. Thank you very much.